Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our After Hours Screen Talk. I'm Dan, and I'm here with Tenian, as always. Today, we're going to talk about the newly released horror film, In a Violent Nature, uh, written and directed by Chris Nash, and what I believe is his feature directorial debut. I just want to say right off the bat that I haven't seen the movie. There are no screenings in my area. I didn't get the early access to it. That said, there are spoilers ahead. We're going to talk about the film in relative depth. The film uh, follows the exploits of the central slasher killer named Johnny. He is a Jason Voorhees-like juggernaut who terrorizes a series of people, mostly teenagers, in the rugged Ontario landscape. In addition to the camera work, the landscape is also a major feature, one of the elements that really sticks out. This film keeps very close to the typical well-established tropes of the slasher subgenre. We have a mostly faceless, completely mute killer who is indestructible. We have have the idea that he's driven by revenge. There is a, a past trauma, a formative trauma that has shaped him into the monster that he is. His victims are more or less exclusively teenagers or young people. Also very much in keeping with slasher conventions, the central killer is identified with a series of central singular objects. In this case, an old firefighter's mask, a grappling hook, and then also an axe and various other implements. Those objects are a part of his origin story uh, so classic classic slasher movie setup the most direct ancestor for this film very much feels like friday the 13th the sequels that is where jason voorhees becomes the major killer the killer in this film most closely resembles him in terms of uh, physicality, appearance. Really, it, it could just be Jason Voorhees who's walked into the uh, Ontario landscape and is occupying this film. So that seems like the, the most direct frame of reference. I want to focus on, on the idea of who we identify with and how identification based on camera works. So like in a technical, typical slasher film, is, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the camera switches back and forth through points of identification, spends a, a good deal of time with the killer's ostensible point of view, but then increasingly as the film progresses, spends more time identifying and isolating the final victim survivor or the so-called final girl usually. And then increasingly the camera identifies more and more with her and her viewpoint becomes more and more the central one. Uh, this is at least the template established by academics like Carol J. Clover in her seminal work, Men, Women, and Chainsaws. This film doesn't flip the script so much, but what it does do is it spends much more sustained time with the killer. And in fact, I think one of the true innovations of the film, the only one I can really point to, is that this film, because it spends so much time with the killer, the film demystifies the slasher killer and his movements. So in classic slasher films like Halloween and, and dozens of others, if not hundreds, uh, the killer is mostly off screen, mostly invisible. Uh, and the idea of, of his or their movement is mysterious. How do they end up where they are? How are they so silent? How can they anticipate their victims' moves with such prescience? Uh, apparent prescience. Here, that is totally demystified. We follow the killer from the camera's perspective, often directly behind him as he walks through the Ontario forest and encounters victims. So as a result of this, we don't get those classic moments in the film where the you know the the killer is just all of a sudden there we see him approach a campsite or a cabin we see him navigate around the property we see him isolate and target a victim we're with him virtually every second of the process now there's a there's a big problem i think on the level of audio that that became increasingly apparent to me and that is that this killer walking through the forest is so effing loud I mean, <laughs> his boots, like he has such a heavy trod. Every single time he he plants a foot on the ground, it's like crunch, crunch, crunch. And so the film has to engage in in cheats here and there. So for instance, one time there's a character, he's on um, earbuds. 
So, so that's why he can't hear this guy, you know, coming up on him. But like the question that increasingly occurs to you is like, how do they not hear this monstrous juggernaut of a character making no attempt to, to hide his movements? Like he's not sneaking, right? He's just plotting through. So the audio becomes a little problematic there if you want to buy into this idea that he really is coming upon them and they don't hear him, they don't see him until it's too late, which ha happens in a lot of cases. So he is able to, to catch them by surprise. And the question becomes, how exactly is he able to do that if he's so loud? And that was what I was going to ask in regards to the actual kill sequences, because they have the capacity to run. And if he's always walking at the same tread pace, then it could lead to some unintentional comedy humor that they're just not running away and defending themselves better. I don't know. Yeah, well, there were several people in the theater with me, and the, and the way they were interacting with the film was very reminiscent of the way that, that audiences have historically interacted with slasher films. Kind of like a combination of gross out when the, the kills occur, but also kind of like mocking the setup. There was a lot of laughter, levity. Really? What the film is doing is creating a different relationship to time and space in the film. Um, Chris Nash has said that he was um, influenced by minimalist cinema, uh, and he's the films of Terrence Malick also figure prominently in his answers to questions about where his influences come from. That's a pretty striking um, connection because, I mean, Malick certainly isn't known for doing horror films. Uh, what he is known, though, for is extensive, often philosophically minded explorations of time and space in film. And what I found myself doing is just thinking much more about the time it takes for this killer, for the, the for this violence to unfold. So we think about the space and the time and how space and time are implicated in the acts of atrocious violence that unfold. A typical moment in the film consists of he kills somebody, and then if there's more than one person, that you know the other person escapes. So for instance, on an ATV, they drive off, and then the killer turns towards them and just walks. And then we're talking about like a Three, a three to five minute sequence of him just walking, 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 like a homing beacon. Somehow he knows approximately where they're going. So one of the things I say that the, the killer's movements are demystified, but one of the things that remains mysterious is how precisely he knows where he's going and where they're going by extension, because he's heading where they are. So spoiler alert, the nominal motivation for his killing spree is that uh, there's a locket that was given to him by his mother. And this locket is the only thing that lets his spirit rest in peace. So at the very beginning of the film, this pack of stupid teenagers comes upon what is essentially his shrine, his you know, where he's been laid to rest. He's a revived corpse. Yes. So um, the, the locket is hanging directly over um, a pipe that's or a stick that's just sticking up out of the ground. So somebody takes the locket, and in taking the locket, they disturb his peace. So he comes out of the ground and and resurrects and, and goes on this killing spree. And, and what is he looking for? He's looking for the locket. And that's the reason that he's on this killing spree. He wants the locket back and is spending the film trying to get it. Now, having said that, it's also really about the killing. It's about the revenge taking. We get the definite sense that just because he's got the locket which he does by the end of the film by the way he has the locket by the end of the film we don't get the sense that the killing is going to stop because he has the locket definitely one of the traditional things this film gives you is bloody mayhem the killer dispatches his victims in a way that is very much in keeping with the well-established conventions of slasher films bloody um prolonged imaginative utilizing uh multiple implements and then in the last 20 minutes or so, maybe longer, you're pretty much with the person who functions as the victim survivor, Chris. She's the final girl, such as such as that character even exists in this film. And that's also, I think, a really interesting thing. Spending so much time with the killer renders the, the, the victims, including the survivor, even more nondescript and forgettable than they are in the traditional slasher films, which is to say already pretty forgettable, right? Is the killer, like a lot of mass killers, slashers, is he more of just kind of like this masked figure who remains mysterious, enigmatic, and that we just project upon this masked killer our fears and 
anxieties and it becomes like a vector for that or do we in, on some level in the movie like get to understand this uh killer is he humanized in any way when you're talking about um sympathy or identification with the killer i think one of the things that's striking about slasher films is the way they evacuate the question of morality altogether there's really very little difference fundamentally between him and other slasher killers He's, he's very much legible within the traditional trope, that the film does nothing new with this character. So I don't identify with him at all. He is of interest only as um, an agent, a vector, as you say, for the violence, the mayhem that ensues. So he's an agent of the sadistic thrill, right? The fact that he, he is the killer and engages in these, these protracted uh, moments of brutal murder. Uh, and that's fun, of course. That's a thrill, a sadistic thrill for the viewer. But he's also interesting as an example of what can happen when trauma masters a person. Just this sort of repetitive force pushed to and fro by this violent, vengeful will. He's an automaton, very much like the like other slasher killers, with the exception of killers like Freddy Krueger are automatons, right? At bottom, these films are not concern with questions of morality. And, and I think that that's one of the things we've really historically misunderstood about these films, this idea that these, these are morally conservative films that are punishing teenagers for promiscuous sex and drugs, for instance. What's really fundamentally going on in these films is not that they're engaging in this behavior, but that in engaging in this behavior, they're not paying attention to the fundamental struggle um, that is unfolding in their lives. And that is the imminent question of life or death and what will happen, what will they do when they find themselves in that fight or flight moment. I think that the final girl, what, what makes her successful as a character is not that she abstains from sex or drugs or any of that, but that she's vigilant. She's attuned to this, this dimension of brutality in, uh, in life that the other characters simply don't take stock of. They're clueless. They're not careful. Um, and that's that's the really operative thing that I think interests me about these films. So I actually think, I mean, as, as much as it has become a trope in these films that, yes, the characters who engage in sex and drugs and, and promiscuous activities, they're the ones who end up dead. But I don't think there's a causal relationship directly. I think the issue is they're not paying attention. Yeah. They're not paying attention to the violence that is unfolding almost literally within feet of them in a lot of cases. And it's that lack of vigilance that is really the problem. But the slow cinematic aesthetic of the film and the fact that we spend so much time in the Ontario forest following the killer and becoming conscious of and meditating upon the landscape, the whole world of this forest and, and everything beyond it by implication is a terrible place. Every place in this film is haunted by the potential for atrocious violence. In addition to the landscape, I think what's really, really interesting is that we do get a victim survivor. We do get a final girl at the end of the film. We get Chris. And so she's got all the hallmarks, right? She has a, an androgynous, androgynous name. She doesn't have an apparent partner. Um, and so she's, and she's someone who I think we can pick out as trained viewers of slasher films pretty early on, even considering how little camera or screen time she gets. Um, but what happens at the end of the film is the killer kind of disappears. And then we're just left with her as she's now moving through the forest she occupies the place in the camera that the slasher killer spent most of the time occupying so we get that switch that that uh i think we're accustomed to right that point of identification does switch so she's injured and she's plodding her way through the forest desperately trying to get out um and eventually she's picked up she hitchhikes a woman who's going to take her to a hospital and what's really interesting is that while the woman is driving her to the hospital, she tells a story of another moment of formative trauma. Uh, her brother was attacked by a bear in the woods. Mm -hmm. Now, the clear implication is that this bear was, was Johnny. This is another one of his rampages, right? But it's not totally clear. Um, it could have been just a bear. But the point is that... I was reading reviews of these of this moment, and one guy was like, "This story has nothing to do with the rest of the 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 film. It's just freaking pointless." I was like, "Oh no, it's not pointless." I mean, the point she's trying to make to this girl is like, "Well, he got through it because he survived the bear attack. 
He got through it in one piece and you will too. I think it's a brilliant moment because it invokes what many people take to be the first slasher film, which is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The fundamental question in these films isn't, are you good or are you bad? Did you do the right thing or the wrong thing? The fundamental question is, did you survive and what's left of you? The formative question presented in Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the question for slasher films. Did you survive and are you still you? Or if you aren't still you, what or who are you? And how are you going to continue in the world? For me, like the test of a horror film is at the end of watching it, I feel like the movie has made the horror resonate and brought it into a familiar zone that's not uncomfortable. It's no longer in this like self-contained form that I can watch it from a distance and take pleasure in it. Now it's right up in my face. And as we say, too close to home now, did this film like leave you in that state? Not quite. It's not a totally successful experiment. And I think it's because Nash uh, is, is sort of dividing his attention between the formal experiment he wants to he wanted to do, but then also really very much wanting to remain loyal to and within the slasher formula. And it's interesting how for me, the least successful parts for me are the ones that are the most beholden to the conventional tropes. He wants to give you that payoff. So there's there's a really grisly murder scene. When you go see the film, you'll know exactly which one I mean. Um, you know, it's it's uh, the um the reaction of of one of the viewers in the audience was, "Are you kidding me?" Really? Um, so yeah, so it's like wow. it just it just keeps going on. It's like, well, surely he's done now, right? This is, but no, the the it it, it moves past murder into this this extended sequence of just a, abysmal mutilation of a corpse. And how does that um, compare to like the Terrifier movies? So very works. much uh, yeah i think it's it's not as bad as the first terrifier movie where of course i mean that the art the clown bisects a woman with a handsaw right or a hacksaw it's not as bad as that it's a murder that's so shockingly absurd and brutal that it's actually kind of funny i think that doesn't actually benefit the film i don't think this film benefits from the, those moments of humor and there are a fair number of them uh people were laughing in the film quite a bit and I don't think it was totally because they were trying to like exercise the discomfort they were feeling. I think there are a lot of moments in this film that don't quite come off. So you think the humor was intentional to make it kind of yeah, I, I, the, or something? The, yeah, the murder sequence I'm I'm describing. I, I you know it, you can't watch it without thinking this is just utterly absurd. I mean, this it's ridiculous. I didn't laugh, um, but I I was smiling through it. I, I think I like, heard this, about yeah. this. Is this the yoga kill? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's 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 absurd. And and it's I can very much see why somebody would laugh at it because it's it's brutal to the point of of farce. Is this a film though you would revisit, you'd watch again, or is it a one time viewing? I'd watch it again. I give it a, you know, if I had to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, Ebert style, I'd I'd give it a thumbs up because I think it it's worth revisiting. It was, it's definitely a film I'd watch again to try to like sort of like reconsider and think about the, the reactions I had when I first watched it. All right. I'm very grateful, by the way, I saw it on the big screen because it's beautiful on the big, big screen, that Ontario, Ontario landscape. It is, it is a, a formal achievement. Well, even just from the trailer, there was just a striking sense of place and locale. That's where the film really sings. The, the, the moments that are really successful are successful because of the way that that Nash really wanted to utilize the, the landscape. All right, so this has been another uh, edition of our After Hours Screen Talk. I'm Dan, this is Tenian. Uh, please hit the like button, subscribe, stay tuned for new content. If you haven't seen In a Violent Nature, it's worth seeing in the theaters.